Hi, and welcome to Art Alab, a podcast dedicated to conversations on visual culture with me, Kamaini. Today, we have with us a doctoral student of cinema studies, Rakesh Sengupta, whose work has been recognized for its significance in the area of scholarship on the history of screenwriting. Often, work produced in academia um, needs to take the form of a book before it's introduced and discussed in the public context of ideas and opened up to non-academic enthusiasts. And often, even those books that do get attention end up almost exclusively being by already established scholars. So I thought that it might be an interesting idea for Ardalap to take up essays by early career academics as a point of entry and uh, conversation. Uh, of course, I hope to invite scholars who've contributed authoritative works and ideas to the discourse on the visual arts as well. Um, uh, and I think that providing a platform through which both well-known and upcoming academics unpack their work in various modes can be just as illuminating as traditional formats like colloquia, um, seminars and panel discussions. Uh, the difference, of course, being that most of these latter formats aren't available or indeed pitched for public engagement. Um, so this is a kind of collective in that regard. Um, on today's episode, uh, Rakesh and I are going to discuss his award-winning essay, Writing from the Margins of Media, Screenwriting Practice and Discourse During the First Indian Talkies, published in the December 2018 issue of Bioscope, uh, number 9.2. We talk about the way in which the lack of script archives dictated the methods of research, how the vocation of screenwriting propelled fantasies of self-improvement and socio-economic ascendancy in the 1930s and 40s, and the way in which the study of early cinema has been revitalized in the contemporary context of OTT and web programming. We also have some lovely anecdotes about serendipitous discoveries of forgotten Indian cinema scripts in other corners of the world. Let me introduce you to him. Uh, Rakesh is a PhD candidate in South Asian Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, that is SOAS, University of London. His doctoral project on early screenwriting practices in Indian cinema is an interdisciplinary engagement with film history, media ethnography, print culture and critical theory. Rakesh's research article in Bioscope, the one that we talk about today in detail, was awarded the best journal article by Screenwriting Research Network and also received high commendation for Screen's Annette Kuhn debut essay prize, uh, which is one of the reasons that I thought it would be a good idea to have a conversation with him on Artalap. Uh, hi and welcome uh, to Artalap, Rakesh. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Kamaini. It's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you again for having me. And uh, as you've mentioned, I am uh, your first academic guest and also an early career ac academic. And um, so, and I've also really enjoyed the previous conversations. So, and I'm really looking forward to this one. Thank you so much. Before we continue, I'd like to let our listeners know how to access the material accompanying our conversation. To view the images and other material being referenced and discussed in the episode, click on the link in the show notes to access the guide. You can also find the link to the guide for each episode in our Instagram captions and tweets. Rakesh and I uh, became acquainted with each other through Sarai, uh, which is the media studies program at CSDS. Uh, New Delhi, where I was a research associate and Rakesh was our library resident. He was working on his doctoral research uh, and we had a lot of lunches together as a group of co-workers. Uh, so we ended up having a lot of conversations uh, during those lunches. And I'm, so in some sense, I think of this as an extension of that. So, you know, Rakesh, just to set up the broader contours of your interdisciplinary scholarship, I thought it might be a good uh, idea for you to talk a bit about how you arrived at this particular, you know, juncture of classical film history, um, ethnography, media studies, media archaeology and um, area studies. Uh, what in your training and, you know, maybe even pursuit of personal interest led you to this inquiry about the literary and theatrical infrastructural basis, if, if you like, of um, early Indian cinema? So I am formally trained in um, literary studies, specifically English literature, for seven years. So I did my bachelor's, I did my master's and my MPhil in English literature. I did my bachelor's from Calcutta University, where uh, uh, the syllabus is very canonical. So I think I grew very averse to that kind of uh, literature that was available to me. I did benefit a lot. 
but that is also the time when i started watching a lot of european cinema so these two things were happening at the same time for me then i moved to delhi for my graduate uh, for my post graduation in delhi university and also my mphil later on in jamia millia islamia and people within english literature circles would know this quite well so in delhi english mm-hmm. literature functions almost as a de facto cultural studies department uh, where we study everything uh, under the universe almost not literally everything right. but almost everything uh, under the broader rubric of text so i had this interest in cinema for the longest time and then i also had the freedom to actually study these things within the department so while i was being formally trained in literary studies in some ways literary theory uh, cultural studies i was also self training uh, getting self trained in film studies so that is how this happened and now i'm doing my phd in uh, an area studies department uh, specifically south asian studies of course under a film historian and a literary historian so again there's this intermedial tussle mm-hmm. that's going on even in my mentoring right so that that is why screen writing emerged as this uh, practice this process that really yeah. brings the two worlds together for me literature and cinema so if you if you're asking for an academic genealogy i think that's where it lies for me the cinema has all of these sensorial components and the form and language and grammar of cinema is in some sense medium specific like it is with all media forms right i mean not again and your you know research proves it's never entirely independent i mean these are all interdependent kind of linkages and and and, in, and there's a lot of incest a uh, mediatic incest but uh, at the same time you know you find that people come with us as this kind of training mm-hmm. that can be quite conventional and as you said also orthodox in some ways and then to encounter film studies a discipline which is still somewhat a uh, nascent in in south asia in india so i find that also interesting that you talk about literary studies as um, this kind of almost uh, you know inevitable uh, predecessor to an education or a life in film studies scholarship or cinema studies scholarship i'm just to kind of dive into your essay as well i think we could i could begin you know our discussion of your essay proper by quoting a couple of phrases which i think kind of capture the essence of your approach to recovering i mean i'm speaking crudely to recovering a history of cinema through its verbal incarnations and i think that i'm using the uh, phrase verbal incarnations in a way that's quite uh, deliberate and we will come back to it because i have other questions you know that come come out of this uh, formulation um you write that in your essay that you attempt to quote historicize the spectral figure of the screen writer by engaging quote with this archival absence of film scripts as a heuristic rather than a handicap so clearly you're seeing this as a generative mode you're taking something that might be seen as a sort of lack and you're you know to uh, sort of turning it on its head so do you want to talk about that so uh, just to go back a little bit um, so when i again and in continuation with the with the previous answer of mine so w- when i did my mphil i wrote about film adaptation uh, and that's something that almost every literature uh, student also interested in cinema would eventually do right the reason for my shift to screen writing was because it was giving me a very specific site a very specific practice and a specific process to work on so the reason i started working on screen writing was because of intermediality firstly uh, and also because it was facilitated by my interdisciplinary training but then i actually started doing film history so it's one thing reading film history and then it's another thing doing film history so i thought i mean okay i looked up uh, the nfai national film archive of india catalog uh, and they have yeah. listed probably thousands of scripts in their archive so so i went there expecting to be you know encountering this plethora of material and then what i found out was that these were post production documents these were transcripts right. of films that were sent to film censors <laughs> so that's when i realized okay maybe i have chosen the wrong topic film historians yeah. talk a lot about absence but they'll still find something right some traces of films um there there are these difficulties but in this particular case it mm-hmm. was that the very object of the subject was absolutely missing so so i began to think more and more about it i didn't want to give it up because i was still interested in inter- intermediality and i thought why not why not turn this into an advantage this crisis this archival crisis and uh, in the in the context of this particular paper 
the moment of the talkies, which is, uh, I would say, the period of its anticipation uh, from, say, around 1927 when it arrives in Hollywood yeah. and to its moment of arrival, actual arrival in India in 1931, this emerged as a very rich moment of discourse for me, where a lot is being written about screenwriting because screenwriting has to be rethought. We are going to talk not just through images now, but through dialogue, through songs. And of course, we also have to be mindful that theater was sort of the dominant medium of the time. So, so, it, it, so cinema would in some ways remediate theater. So to make this shift possible, and as with everything else, when there's an anticipation of anything, there's a market that is built around it. So there's a lot of writing. Manuals come in. So I started looking at these manuals that were written. Could this be the source? It was being posited as something um, very promising, uh, this field of screenwriting. These are also fictions of opportunity in some ways, right? So that really got me thinking. And then I started looking at what was actually happening in the studios. What was actually happening was the shift of, hmm. like, not like a totalizing kind of shift, but a shift of some theater personnel into film studios hmm. to facilitate this transition. And especially screenwriters in this case. So how do, you, how do you write dialogues? How do you write songs? How do you write stories where there are words? You get people from theater. And this happened in Hollywood as well. And this gave me the encouragement to actually yeah. study screenwriting without film scripts. Uh, so this is where the handicap, and I'm, and I'm very um, apologetic about using that word now uh, because it's, yeah. it's quite offensive to many people. Uh, but when I wrote that, I did not have a sense of uh, how it might be offensive. But it turned from a disadvantage to uh, an advantage because I could explore things that I wouldn't have been able to explore if I had those scripts. It would have just turned into a kind of textual comparative study across the scripts and the films if they were available in the first place. But I think epistemologically, that is a question that we still need to work out. Why? Mm. Why do we still think of uh, the script as a blueprint? Why do we think of screenwriting as the composition of a script that is a blueprint? Mm. Why are we so uncomfortable about songs in film narratives? Mm. Why, do they, why do we think they lie outside the script? So because of this archival absence, I was able to rethink mm. some of these biases, so to say, and also come up with new ways of trying to think about Bombay cinema. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting also, you know, what you're talking about in terms of even thinking about, in terms of um, uh, conceptualizing uh, early cinema or cinema at any point of time, really. Uh, but also, you know, coming back to uh, this fascinating kind of um, study that you've done of um, these scenario manuals that you were just talking about, right? This this kind of taking up of text in cinema in, in this antique way, where it's not about the script, it's about all the other textual kind of circumscriptions, right? So... Um, I find that really interesting that you talked about these scenario manuals as, mm. as like a kind of fictions of opportunity, right? Because it's it's like this kind of, you know, or BMM, Bachelor of Mass Media Logic, right? <laughs> like happening in the 30s, where like everyone's suddenly thinking they can get a job out of this. <laughs> and it's playing on a certain kind of emergent, you know, uh, maybe a literate ambition or whatever, you know, something of that kind. And you looked at memoirs of screenwriters that you you know mentioned in the essay. You've you've mentioned you've cited first person accounts recorded in the Indian Cinematograph Committee proceedings, and then of course these scenario manuals. All of this in the absence of scripts themselves. So all of these sites sort of help draw attention to the to the multimedial complex, right, of literature and theater, uh, in which Indian cinema existed, and indeed a global complex. I, you know, I was really surprised to learn that Indian um, screenwriters were freelancing. For Hollywood projects, you mentioned this in your, you, you know, in your work, like who are these people who are, you know, uh, that, whose labor is part of the Hollywood machinery, American cinema machinery. Um, and you have foreign and Indian published guidebooks, which are circulating widely. I'm really fascinated. Tell us more about this infrastructure, what you call a parallel pedagogical infrastructure. I mean, you touched upon it briefly, but I think there's a lot more to unpack. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's still relevant. It's more probably more relevant in the contemporary because even if the listeners are not really aware or maybe interested in screenwriting per se, they will definitely know that screenwriting manuals are very popular in the book market, right? And they, they're sometimes they're the best sellers. There are these screenwriting um, conferences that happen. And some of the screenwriting gurus, uh, like say Sitfield or Robert McKee, <laughs> they, they have not 
some of them have not even written a single script, but yeah, they, they exactly. are somehow these kind of self-help figures as well. So, so I think there's a kind of intensification of that discourse that I was telling you about of, you know, there's this fiction of opportunity, there's this, uh, you know, you can become... So, so some of the Hollywood manuals that I've looked at, and this is uh, in reference to a particular, what you call a clearing house, where you keep a lot of scripts and then you make films from some of them. So right. this one was called the Palmer Photoplay Corporation. And the kind of, I have mentioned it probably in one of the footnotes. You have, yeah. So, and, and the kind of rhetoric that they use, it's, it's like, even if you don't get a job, you'll end up becoming a better person. That's literally what they say. So, so this relationship between screenwriting discourse and self-help discourse is something that emerged absolutely serendipitously. And uh, while I was also told not to go too deep into it because I started looking at uh, histories of unemployment in India and I looked at that particular period from 19, uh, through the 1930s when these manuals were extremely popular. And it turned out that this was also a time of peak industrial uh, age unemployment, also mm -hmm. recession in the US, so that, that had certain effects uh, on the Indian landscape. So, so this was also a time of peak unemployment. And there were so many surveys that were written uh, on um, the unemployed of educated, mm -hmm. English educated young men. Yeah. That was the category. So again, English becomes very important because these all these manuals are written in English, right? right? So there is a desire uh, to read about cinema. There is acute unemployment. And then there's this growing market of cinema, which will not really take in outsiders. It works through its own networks. I mean, this is, again, it's something that's very true in the contemporary. I know we were being facetious about the BMM logic, but actually that's kind of not so different in the sense that there is a kind of neoliberal um, moment post-91, right? Where suddenly you have a mushrooming of mass media education as kind of uh, something that the middle class uh, can, can, can access. And, and again, you know, maybe uh, uh, obtain a better, secure a better life. So there's something to this kind of logic of financial, you know, recession, uh, unemployment and preying upon, you know, by commercial uh, firmaments and establishments on people's, uh, you know, desire to uh, be upwardly mobile uh, in, a, in, a, in a context which makes it very difficult to be so. So, I mean, yeah, it, so we have to think of early cinema as a commodity in its purest form. It was traveling, right? The, 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 the earliest uh, forms of film had to travel. The f people who made them, sometimes the people who even developed these equipment had to travel with those films. So, so this is cinema in its purest form. The, the, the networks, the infrastructures are not properly developed. It's very human in a sense. And that's something that I was also trying to um, look at through this idea of intermediality. I mean, there, there's, there are, of course, abstract ways of uh, abstract theoretical ways mm -hmm. of studying intermediality as exchange between media uh, uh, forms and so on yeah. and, and through remediation, looking at the old in the new and new in the old and so on. But who facilitates these shifts? They're people. And uh, to go back to your question, uh, and sometimes mm -hmm. during these shifts, there's a lot else that goes on in the background yeah. uh, that contributes more to a, say, a sociological understanding of cinema. Uh, even if not aesthetic and industrial. But I thought that was also very important because screenwriting is also very, very aspirational because it's not, it's not film direction, right? It, you might want to become a film director, but you know that you don't have the tools to do it. it it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult undertaking, both artistically and commercially, and you don't need to be in certain networks. You, most people have no idea about how to yeah. direct a film. I mean, at least in the pre-cell phone age. But you know how to write. And most of us in schools are taught how to write um, short stories and uh, essay writing and things like that. So, so this is a bit like mm -hmm. that, tapping into that market of people who have just learned English yeah. and they want to use that ability to improve their life. To, to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, their fullest. It should be like the script writer who optioned his script. You know, like the monk who sold his Ferrari. That kind of logic. Yeah, absolutely. 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 It's really funny, actually. I was just reminded of the fact that even in like, when you talk about, uh, you know, like recovering uh, cinematic objects through all of these indexes, let's say the script form. I was reminded how, you know, when we were younger, I mean, you and I are about the same age. When we were younger, pre-torrent, the pre the torrent era, uh, you couldn't just watch films online, right? So what ended up happening was I discovered like databases of scripts online. 
and then i would just like read all these hollywood scripts when i was like 12 13 whatever because i couldn't watch these movies and i was just reading the scripts and imagining and then years later i would watch the film and be like acha this is it's kind of what i had imagined you know or like completely a departure so it's also interesting to uh, kind of work with these uh, objects in that way where so much of it is also your fantasy and projection even as a scholar yeah i just thought that was also kind of a strange part of conducting research of this kind certainly i think it's a what you what you're hinting at is a form of like a vicarious form of pleasure uh when you don't have access to the film uh you have you can look at the script which is readily available online to so think of it like in that time yeah. uh you don't really have access to the industry by but by reading about cinema through this language of opportunity fiction of opportunity you are vicariously living your dream to be in the industry it's it's a very kind of yeah. participatory kind of pleasure in the absence of real opportunities yeah and you know, i also want to come back to my use of the phrase that i flagged out the verbal incarnation of cinema I wasn't quite sure how else to formulate it but the reason i used it is because uh, words are so central in a sense language is so central to this understanding that you're developing of film and uh, especially in terms of i was thinking of the advent of sound you know as a technological factor in the making of motion pictures in india i mean this is a, an essay about the talkies so um, you know you obviously dialogue becomes important and that's you know what you peg the theatrical turn on to in a sense because suddenly you, you know you have all these playwrights who become experimental artists in a sense in the cinematic realm so do you want to take up these two threads you know like uh, a sound studies sort of perspective and the parsi theater as a well theorized president but also your argument is that actually there was no drastic rupture like i mean it's again what you know a remediation it's not something that's like cinema doesn't become this completely new entity because for the longest time the two are also coexisting still silent movies and talkies so these two strands of the sound of sound and you know the parsi theater in bombay cinema specifically do you want to just talk about you know what this meant for film production in the 1930s again the films don't exist but there's some writing that is available through interviews mainly that were taken say around the 1940s and 50s when yeah. um, these pioneers of talkies in india if we can call them that ardish irani yeah. the wadia brothers some of these interviews were taken and they do they do talk about the challenges of indoor recording versus outdoor recording because the equipment is not really the best quality they couldn't procure the latest equipment at times yeah. and even if they did they did not know how to who would handle this kind of equipment so they had to get a foreign technician on board right. so william deming turned out to right. be this this person who traveled across india working in different studios and i think he's also written um something about his experiences uh, not necessarily in very um good terms huh. so yeah, <laughs> yeah so i think his experience yeah i don't think he had very good experiences um so so uh, so there is some writing on that but in this particular article in this particular study um my sense is that sound was a novelty at this time yeah. they were not really thinking through sound a lot the, the the struggle was technological and not really aesthetic so and they could only think of sound i think in terms of dialogue and songs because uh, the earliest talky that is publicly available um from the wadias is um, lale yaman which is also oh, available okay. on, yeah also available in on youtube you can sense that the focus is entirely on dialogues and sounds because other kinds mm. of sounds are not there got it mm. yeah and um the, the frontality is very much there in mm. the, in a film like that because it's yeah. it's very theatrical right they're still working right. out uh the grammar of talkies and they yeah. had to go back even if silent mm. film had developed in a particular way right. and that's why there's there's so much writing around whether the talkies should become the norm which is a right. very interesting um, yeah. again uh, discourse happening around that time which also reflects anxieties that are there in the contemporary as well like yeah. will ott replace bollywood will the multiplex yeah. replace bollywood yeah. and so on so there is this deep anxiety about whether yeah. the talkies are here to stay yeah but yeah my sense is that it was a novelty and they could only think of sound in terms of songs fit in as many songs as possible so some, one film i think had 70 songs and that's i i don't know how that was possible this was in 19 31 I mean, it was basically maybe... just a string of songs it was like music videos yeah. one after the other yeah it, yeah it was just like that so they, they were waiting for an opportunity to break into a song right, right. and yeah so and that exchange with parsi theater 
really hmm. laid the foundations of indian cinema um, yeah. there are definitely other influences at play hmm. but uh, from what i have sensed in my research i think that that's really the foundation and i don't mean to say that parsi theater is really indigenous in any essential sense of the word because it was also building on proscenium theater shakespearean theater and yeah. so on but it had developed uh, a very um, crude way a very south asian or and even southeast asian sensibility because yeah. it also traveled outside south asian borders yeah and that's why that's where these films were also distributed so mm. parsi the, the the link between sound and parsi theater is cr- absolutely crucial and i think that's also the link between the technical and the cultural and how these uh, had the, how the new form of the indian talkie emerged right right yeah and you know as you've uh, so uh, succinctly sort of summarized uh, th- there's a lot of uh, re- research by film scholars in the past uh, couple of decades that talks about this uh, you know for instance mm-hmm. the darshanik logic the frontal logic i think ashish rajatakshi has talked about it and um lots of sound scholars have talked about you know sound as a, as a kind of cinematic uh, technology and apparatus um and yeah there are all these linkages it's also interesting to think about parsi theater as a as a kind of uh, not i mean in trying to move away from the essentialism that often uh, you know uh, uh, inflects these discussions uh, one needn't forget that like there is a kind of creolization that or hybrid realization in a sense that uh, emerges right in specific parts of the world um, which is not to sort of take away from the influence global influences or cosmopolitan influences and you know historical kind of genealogies of any of these practices but the fact that they kind of that, that area becomes a crucible uh, is also interesting for for the particular combination of things to work out and take that shape so i think which i think is what you're saying so um, that's that is interesting that this kind of relationship between and all of the people that you talked about you know the major studio um, guys and producers are all parsi whether it's adishi rani whether it's tawadias whether it's uh, sora modi uh, all of these guys are kind of the big players and you know they, they definitely come with that uh, that legacy cultural legacy to form so you know i also think like I wanted to zoom out for a minute from the essay proper and just talk a bit about the broader landscape of early Indian cinema studies. I wanted to discuss his the historiography with you as a scholar yourself, um, and how you locate your work in that landscape. You know, as we noted when we had our discussion uh, last, that there w- that there hasn't been as much work as there should be, in a sense, on this period of Indian history for all of these reasons that we've been talking about. Uh, and a big part of that is the lack of uh, sort of extant material right uh, which can be very discouraging i mean you you also had a moment of uh, sort of you know uh, concern and anxiety regarding whether you should follow this trail uh, so one theme that recurs across the work of some of the you know eminent scholars in this field is that of methodological innovation in in the absence of this official archive and i think indian cinema scholars just we have a very like most scholars of film perhaps around the world have a very strange psychosexual relationship with the archive it's like everyone's talking about the lack constantly <laughs> and you know and i just think we should talk about some of the people who've done work you know whether it's kaushik bhamek who worked on early indian cinema like 20 years ago right and uh, and you know he's drawn from the constructs of urban planning and the logic of the bazaar or whether it's priya jaikobar who's discussed cinema made in india um, on a, a continuum with colonial with colonial works produced in this in this area you know or even uh, debashree's mukherjee is use of the you know the concept of the scandal for instance to to analyze gendered subjectivities and then of course her recent work which is but she talks about labor as a as a uses it as a conceptual mode to um, sort of articulate the, the you know in the workings of indian of the bombay film industry um so all of these people have tried to you know have had to be maverick and you just like you have had to be uh, so how do you depart from a concur with these scholars is a question that i wanted to ask because because it's such a small field in a sense there are all these conversations that all of you guys are having at various levels yeah and there's there's bound to be disagreements in methodology or you know uh, or even agreements or like you know you're referring to each other's work all the time so tell us a bit about that like how do you think of your work in that complex of people that's a great question kamaini um and be- because uh, i'm i'm not sure if the audience would be familiar uh, with the field of indian film history um, i should mention that uh, it's an extremely rich field uh, 
So, so their work has been the ones that you have mentioned, Devushri Mukherjee, her work on um, the female uh, figure in early Bombay cinema, how things like rumors work, yeah. and how, and in the absence of an archive, yeah. what can something like a rumor tell us? And again, through print, right? Film magazines, gossip magazines. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what can something like a rumor, mm. which is which is largely, I think, ignored. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's not, it, it's not really empirically reliable. Uh, but she turns it around completely. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's similar to how I'm also trying to methodologically reorient the disadvantage into an advantage. Yeah. Right. Uh, then you have also mentioned Priya Jam Kumar, whose work I think is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Then there's uh, Kaushik Bhomik. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's still uh, amazing that that book hasn't come out. It's a shame. Yeah, I, I did meet him once. Um, and uh, after our long chat, I asked him quite categorically why he had not published. And he said, uh, you know, I'm still working on the conclusion. Yeah. I don't know if he was being sarcastic or something. But... No, I think I feel like I keep telling him, you know, you should have a PR approved answer now. It's to the discredit of the academic publishing firmament, right? That Kaushik's work, which at one level is so, uh, you know, he wrote it two decades ago. This podcast should be like a pressure, like should pressure him into like pushing <laughs> for this. <laughs> I, I really hope that happens because I mean, and uh, and maybe maybe it didn't, I mean, maybe they didn't value it at that time. I'm yeah. sure there is a uh, very yeah. significant academic book market for, um, I mean, you can see this with Bombay Hustle, right? It's a renewed, yeah, it's a renewed, there's a renewed interest for sure. I mean, yeah, I agree. And maybe it's like, you'll talk about it, but maybe it's also the new media kind of anxieties and paranoia, no? Like that's, that's creating that moment because suddenly web, the web and the OTT platforms are creating a sort of new relationship to cinema and, um, you know, what it means. Absolutely. And I mean, in a sort of tongue in cheek way, maybe uh, print also has to show that it is not going obsolete. So it has to bring cinema and I don't know, maybe there's something intermedial going on there. <laughs> Very meta. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely, I have I mean, I've benefited a lot from their scholarship. In addition, I would also think of uh, Ravi Vasudevan's work on uh, of course, yes. the, the, the 1950s socials, because he's doing work in 1989. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and that's just incredible. I don't know yeah. what kind of academic acceptance there was for cinema. Then there's also Rachel Dwyer on mythologicals. So I'm just thinking of genre work that has happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found it extremely interesting, although she doesn't really call it an archaeology in any sense. But in her book, uh, Filming the Gods, she makes it a study of stardom as well towards the end. Yeah. So how stardom emanates from this uh, popularity of mythologicals because stars are like gods in India, right? Yeah. So she makes that linkage without explicitly calling it an archaeology. Then yeah. uh, there's Rosie Thomas's fantastic book on Bombay before Bollywood yeah. because again, she's moving away from both the socials and the mythologicals and looking at orientals. Mm -hmm. So Arabian nights and so on. Then there's, I think there's only one genre left that's action cinema and there's again fantastic work by Valentina Vitali on yeah, it. Of course. Uh, looking, at, look, looking at the conditions of the production of action cinema in the 1930s with the stunt women and then with uh, figures like Dara Singh and so on. Yeah, the, yeah. The exchange between the wrestling community and cinema. I mean, the, these are fascinating linkages that they, they draw upon. And uh, one of my favorites is definitely Sudhir Mahadevan's work. Oh, yes. Yeah, looking at the origins of Indian cinema. Yeah, and kind of disaggregating that whole media scape yeah. across uh, traveling showmen, bioscopes, print culture, photography. And that's, that's just such a brilliant constellation that he puts together. Yeah. And also, I think one of the central um, arguments in his uh, book was something called the obviation of obsolescence. Yes, absolutely. Which I think is a, is a wonderful heuristic for us to work. Yeah, because, because, because we have to understand that new media and old media, the way it's conceptualized in the West, it's more of a kind of replacement, displacement kind of... Whereas here you find multi-temporal kind of logics Absolutely. to the media forms and things coexist Absolutely. all the time or they become re or they get reworked. Yeah. Um, and, as we, and even till today, right? So to think of even things like pre-cinematic technologies or proto-cinematic technologies um, as not just precursors in this kind of anterior sense, but, you know, as, as media forms that continue to animate newer media technologies and this troubling of what is old and what is new. Uh, that in a kind of, and he's, and he's, I also thought like the way he set it up as like cinema being an intermedia, being a kind of techno material infrastructural mode in and of itself was really interesting because then you can bring in all of these what you described as like constellations right and um, and 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 use them to generate new insights about what was happening 
and actually it's great that you brought it up because i was going to ask you about this kind of intermedial i don't want to say turn but like kind of right i mean at one level we know as you know you know this and early media uh, early cinema scholars have always had to contend with intermediality it's not possible to really do a study of early cinema anywhere in the world i think without that sensibility but what do you think like in the past few years you've seen like a more kind of committed sort of delineation of this well, i mean maybe you disagree but i think so what what do you think no no i i definitely agree i i think intermediality is uh, a very important not just concept but also a methodology that uh, film historians in south asia outside south asia have used quite extensively and it's it's provided very rich dividends clearly both not just historical and empirical but also conceptual because it's yeah. it's reorienting us to think about the fundamental question the question um, that sort of founded in some senses film studies is what is cinema right uh, the classic andre bazan question and andre bazan had a very different answer to this <laughs> he, he thought about cinema as this teleological movement of the arts right something yeah. that was that the idea came before the invention that it was predestined so there was this, like it's it's predestination and yeah very abrahamic and yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, so all of that is there and within the western um, kind of framework of thinking around film film and media itself this has been turned around completely yeah um, scholars like tom gunning and uh, um, then there's uh, noel birch and andre gedrot they have just, just opened cinema up completely yeah. they, they they've shown how cinema was not supposed to be a a narrative and not medium specific as well so yeah. it was early cinema is this site when you don't really know what is going on because yeah. you don't know how to market cinema again i am <laughs> going back to the commerce of it rather than the aesthetic but it's that's it's so true yeah 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 so you don't know how to how to pitch cinema to audiences do you call it literature because one of the things that i have um, studied in my uh, thesis as well is this category of boy in in the bengali cinematic landscape so growing up we used the term boy for cinema as well which actually means book so okay. we called both books and films boy uh -huh. and that i mean now nobody talks like that anymore but um, i mean it got me thinking why do we call it boy because i think it was marketed in a particular way in calcutta mm. right and i mean calcutta essentially because of the new theaters and other yeah. kinds of yeah. um, high cultural associations yeah. that they had so so they don't know how to pitch it right so intermediality uh, through um, uh, sudhir mahadevan through uh, stephen hughes who has done amazing work on tamil um, cinema tamil, tamil cinema yeah. tamil music and sort of again disaggregated tamil music across cinema print because song books are also extremely popular at that time yeah. and also theater so so songs are being made in a for theater and then they are made for uh, films yeah. and how it creates this very confusing la media landscape then there's ravi kant's work as well on film print and radio again which is confusing all these boundaries so i think for me especially um, intermediality has been extremely extremely useful and not just from uh, what i have read from say uh, theories of remediation and you know the kind of discourse that is already available yeah. in western scholarship convergence culture and so on henry jenkins yeah but also to root that in a particular location like india because medium specificity it's one thing to just challenge medium specificity specificity but it is also important to uh, be site specific yeah uh, and not in an indigenous kind of autochthonous way uh, yeah. not in an essentialist way but to point out how there's a tension between how media forms arrive because let's i mean let's be honest about it uh, there's very little indigenous media so to say in the 20th century right yeah. it's, it's mainly traveling media yeah. i would call it but then it doesn't just diffuse itself into the subcontinent it it is there is a kind of negotiation that happens yeah. there are certain actors that are left out it could be the amateur screenwriters that i'm talking about it could be a figure like the munshi yeah. uh, who is uh, a part of actually early modern mughal scribal culture mm -hmm. becomes a language teacher in colonial language learning institutions also becomes a dialogue writer in film studios yeah uh, how does he negotiate with this scientific uh, script oriented screenwriting where you have to be very meticulous you have to even type your scripts so somebody who's uh, mm. embedded in scribal culture i mean how does this negotiation happen so i think intermediality opens up all these questions in very very uh, profound ways for me more, not just conceptually but also methodologically and empirically as well yeah yeah i'm also thinking about the you know since you invoked the figure of the munshi i was thinking about and scribal culture itself being so sort of casted in india 
thinking of caste as a very important mode uh, or or like uh, axis along which to uh, track the movement of indian cinemas right i mean even with debashi's work on uh, like her book uh, bombay hustle uh, that was one of the things that i was really curious about like because if you're talking about laboring bodies let's say and the moment you do that in this in the subcontinent you can't escape the question of caste i mean even mm-hmm. like you know who gets to write you know who gets to fantasize uh, about mobility through writing uh, all of those questions become very central and key who gets to be a script writer and so i am one of the things i am personally very interested in as a, as a, as a student of cinema is also to think about aesthetics in terms of caste one of my pet theses and like interests is thinking about indian cinema as basically a feudal caste based kind of you know a business and it's all you know khatri and mercantile caste people the kapoors and the johars who control the capital and the infrastructure logic so how are we not talking about what the aesthetic imagination of these caste groups is that finds its way onto the screen right and like also then through these scripted forms like it's interesting to think about a caste ethnography also of all of these people who are involved right so what do you think absolutely um i mean again like you mentioned the the the, com- the commerce is uh, handled by the kapoors and johars yeah. the cultural side of his uh, side of it is handled by the bosses the chatterjees and the rees the brahmins and the kayas yes. yeah and which again you know the munshi figure itself it's a it's a kind of it's a particular kind of category that yeah. continues from in the ancient to the medieval to the modern era so to speak so yeah and what does that tell you right yeah i mean the munshi um i mean there was a time when the when brahmins also used to be munshis mm. uh, because because that was the the creme de la creme job right yeah. the mughal court uh, being the court scribe so there was a time when brahmins used to learn persian and uh, and try and be <laughs> Ask <for> me. but <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then um, and then it changed gradually because the moment they became uh, language teachers which was quite looked out uh, looked down upon the, the the it became predominantly from the hindu side caste mm. and then from um, and predominantly muslims who would also know persian right. and then in the film industry uh, the same kind of logics are repeated where you have where in the colonial institution colonial language learning institution you have a pandit who's going to be a brahmin yeah. necessarily teaching sanskrit to the colonial officer and the the person who knows the persian would be the munshi teaching yeah. persian to the colonial officer again the same logics are replicated in talkie studios and munshis are hired for writing urdu dialogues mm. uh, pandits are hired for writing hindi dialogues mm. so there are these interesting things that have happened but i think i mean the question of literacy is also important Let, i mean let's be honest i mean i didn't really want to say that the screenwriting screenwriter is a laboring body at all because there's a significant privilege yeah. uh, around writing alone yeah, yeah. because i mean it allows you to uh, write your memoirs create your own histories which i have been a beneficiary of yeah. uh, and then you're also writing you're not really working in a studio and as devushi mukherji has given us examples of mm-hmm. uh, there's there's, a, there's an essay which i can't i can't remember with the name of it mm-hmm. i think it's it's um, the one on shanta apte that came out recently yes, yeah, in though, yeah. Uh, yeah in feminist media histories where yeah. she's talking about how um, these swimmers these um, just die of exhaustion mm-hmm. i'm not sure they were upper caste at all yeah, because if the body is expendable it's 100% not upper yeah, caste you know this from living yeah. in a caste society we don't have to study this right yeah, absolutely so so that kind of um, thing is not there in screenwriting history. so in that way i think it's quite privileged i mean i keep yeah. calling the screenwriter a marginal figure but that's something that is just limited to it's like first world marginalization right absolutely absolutely yeah. so in a way it's it's a replication of the kind of marginalization that is also true for the west uh, where you have so many screenwriting labor unions fighting for copyright and yeah. uh, other similar issues so that it's kind of replication of that mm-hmm. but i wouldn't really call it call the screenwriter a laboring body at all i mean there's plenty to write and I, and i completely agree with you the onus seems to be on um, dalit scholars yeah 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 it, it indeed it uh, it can't be now as a researcher this is a sort of niche area and you had to find out and follow leads that uh, you know aren't handed to you on a platter so um, yeah i mean sometimes i think that media researchers are also like you know we double up as spies and investigators so <laughs> um tell us something about like the thrill of discovery and something that stands out i mean um, often in the west you think of uh, research happening in a very formalized kind of way you go to yeah. the archive you encounter the archival documents you write about them then you think over it and and here we are just waiting for a phone call sometimes a text to come in i mean we are from a bureaucrat it's always a bureaucrat first 
absolutely so so in my case what has happened is i like i told you i gave up on the idea of finding pre production scripts so i i thought of you know doing my research in a completely different way going more into uh, epistemological questions rather than around film production pre production rather than thinking more about how to textually analyze scripts and compare them with the, the the films the resultant films so what happened in the in between was i discovered um that there is someone called peter dates who is thanklessly managing and cataloging one of the richest archives of indian cinema it's the bombay talkies archive family archive so these are Dev, uh, Dev, um, devika rani devika rani sorry how can i forget <laughs> uh, so these are her documents mm. that were with um, her husband uh, the painter rorik 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 yeah. yeah so and then they went to somebody in the us and then the person in the us called peter dates and gave it to him gave oh, all wow. these documents to him so now he's working on these documents he he was also not even aware that i mean i think he was aware that he, he belonged to the film industry in some ways because he is the great grandson of sorry he's the grandson of um, himanshu rai the founder of bombay talk oh, oh wait so yeah. peter dates is the grandson yeah. of himanshu rai Himanshu Rai. He must yeah. have been aware of his uh, pedigree, yeah. I mean, he's also become a historian in so many ways, and he's been cataloging it with mostly, uh, I mean, single-handedly. But he also has a few people who help him out, uh, and he's been trying. He's, I think, so he's based in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and I had the good fortune of uh, visiting Melbourne during this research, and I went to his archive. It was very warm. He also allowed me to take certain some pictures of documents and so on. So, so this was again a very serendipitous way of discovering. some dialogue fragments that are available in his archive not entire scripts but which point to bombay talkies being a more organized and a sort of unique film studio during the time because again if you think about bombay talkies they had crew from professional crew from germany yeah. so they were making films in a different way it was more yeah. organized and that is why these documents have also existed that is the logic i mean if you're closer to the hollywood style of film making then the scripts will be there because yeah. essentially the idea is that hollywood studios keep the scripts yeah bombay studios don't keep the scripts exactly so that so that is how it feeds into the logic of production so this was one uh, discovery yeah. then i reached i managed to track down um, joseph david's great granddaughter so joseph david is also mentioned in this article yeah, yeah. um so he was the screenwriter for alamara so she is based in um, york in the uk mm -hmm. i reached out to her uh she told me see i i know that he was my grand great grandfather but his diary doesn't exist i may, i read about his diary in some other autobiographical account but she d was not in possession of that but months later she suddenly emailed me saying hey you know what i have just found a script written by joseph david in the 1920s sent to hollywood so again wow it reinforces what i was arguing in the not arguing i mean there is other kind of evidence yeah. to point to that that this freelancing that was already going on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in from within bombay for hollywood studios yeah. because this is a time in hollywood 1912 1920 when they call it the scenario fever right so the studio system has not been es uh, essentially established they're still yeah. working around the logics and there's a huge demand for stories because cinema is a booming market and yeah. the audience is not interested in actualities yeah. so actualities are like films like short documentaries um workers coming out of the mill um the electrocution of an elephant and things like that like just just the novelty of watching something on screen mm. so the people were over it they wanted narratives so there was a boom and clearly indian screenwriters were also contributing so i have a document that testifies to that uh, i'm currently in possession of it i have been requested by her to contribute it to one of the archives i'm not right. i'm not very sure about giving it to the nfai but let me see where i can place it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i am for you my listeners i'm just yeah shaking my head don't do that yeah but yeah this is this is these two are really interesting uh, kind of uh, instances of you know having yeah. come upon really like you know uh, and these are transnational entirely transnational there's yeah. another figure called agajani kashmiri mm -hmm. uh, i have he's be, he was based in toronto he was a very uh, famous screenwriter in the 1940s and 50s worked till the 1970s yeah. moved to toronto died there and all his documents are there in ontario uh it's just outside toronto i think um so i've been in touch with his student uh, sorry with his uh, sons and mm -hmm. uh they're very accommodating clearly uh but i'm yet to visit that archive because of the pandemic and all that didn't happen but there are these serendipitous right. discoveries that have happened along the way so the idea is to never foreclose the archive right we have to understand that um it is 
uh, a transnational form. People travel, and sometimes the conditions of the location where you are staying facilitate this kind of archival generation. Yeah. Because if yeah. you if you are staying in Canada, maybe you think you think less about uh, other sources, or other things, and you are more focused on building this because it's also a diasporic memory, right? You have yeah. to also leave something behind. You're uprooted. Mm. Yeah. So there are these interesting things that have yeah, yeah. happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, and, and these examples also like make me think of also like uh, what you said about Peter Dates, right? That there seems to be this this figure of the kind of person doing a lot of yeoman's work, you know, uh, thanklessly on the on the side and often feeding into uh, conventional academic uh, work. I'm thinking of someone like uh, you know Veer Chandram say himself, Absolutely. who is uh, such a who is such an important figure actually. For those of you who don't know, I mean, he's mm-hmm. someone who uh, you know has done. incredible amounts amassed incredible amounts of material on early cinema and all of the scholars who we were talking about uh, any scholar worth their salt has to either consult him in person or like refer to his uh, you know writing uh, because he he in so many ways you know is the ultimate independent researcher on early indian cinema so uh, people like this also are so important to uh, these kind of you know it's also we're talking about a lack like a lack of formal configuration right around these assemblages and they, it bleeds over into the research itself into the historicizing and the studying itself you know you people who are navigating and working through all of these different uh, re- regimes of uh, research who are not actually part of formal administratively recognized systems so i think that's also interesting how the research also kind of mimics the forms itself the cultural forms being studied mm. just to kind of you know uh, like a uh, final question i was thinking of you know the contemporary context in which your research becomes important or research around this or media archaeology or screenwriting let's say becomes important is the ott slash web platform boom right uh, and you know i i'm just I, i'm trying to think about the uh, what you described in your essay like the studio the writing lab logic with multiple people sitting and like writing different you know units of the film script under some sait type figure uh, the playwright slash sait type figure and like the current scenario and I, you've talked about it your phrasing was to sort of set it up as a studio system versus database kind of binary so do you want to just expand on that yeah and to just broadly um, give a background and um, I mean to be very honest the period that i'm looking at i've already mentioned this i think uh, is not as rich as the contemporary right now screenwriting is extremely um, important right now Uh, so you will see these uh, film companion uh, videos uh, of creators sitting together with actors and all of them keep talking about the script this was true for especially for patal lok if you just look at yeah, the discussion yeah. that they had they could couldn't stop talk even the actors the the directors they couldn't stop talking about how fundamental the script was to to developing this show uh, and that makes complete sense right so the general stereotype about a uh, bombay cinema for years has been that it's a messy cultural uh, sort of space this cottage industry uh, and most films are made without scripts yeah but with the coming of uh, multiplexes yeah. around the turn of um, the millennium that perception changed significantly the union that is there uh, that caters to um, Uh, copyright issues of screenwriters and tele- i mean screenwriters as in film writers and television writers and now even content creator- creators on youtube now it's called screenwriters association which was actually rechristened um, while my thesis was uh, being written oh, so okay. i started out when it was called film writers association and now it's called screenwriters so there's they've revamped it completely so so the, that organization began in 1954 uh, got registered as a labor union in 1960 and right now it's ex- extremely important almost everybody who writes a script in india especially in bombay uh, because i'm sure there are other small pockets maybe writers organizations that facilitate the copywriting of scripts in other pockets of india but anybody who writes a script in bombay will register their script with the screenwriters association so they have become very, in terms of rights that that discourse is extremely strong right now and even with um, the coming of the multiplex what happened is there there's a general there's a general uh, emphasis more emphasis on narrative over um songs spectacle and okay. stardom yeah. but it did not intensify get intensified at that moment because the two coexisted what i mean how i would conceptualize the contemporary especially in terms of uh, screenwriting not i mean in terms of broader infrastructures that are there out there um would be that this is a the, the ott pla- ott scenario is actually an extension of the multiplex because you need it because a multiplex needs more films right yeah. so it needs more stories now 
a streaming platform needs i don't know 100 times more films to yeah. establish itself as a streaming platform so they need content which is something that has emerged in contemporary parlance otherwise we used to call it story and screenplay mm-hmm. and so on but now it's content so you have to generate that and that's why the idea of um narrative as content as something that is essential for the creation of a streaming platform has become very important screenwriting has become increasingly formalized yeah so the contemporary has changed quite a lot and there there is um a very strange kind of promotional tactic that has emerged with the script where you will find um, film stars not really i mean they do still use their film posters and teasers and stuff like that but much before that even before they have started working on a film they'll use the script and maybe say a coffee mug ah right and, yes and yeah. and uh, give you an instagram shot of it yeah, yeah, yeah. so you know the, we are embarking yeah. on a new production yeah, yeah. and this is the script so the okay. script is also becoming more visible yeah so there are these interesting things that are happening and the the last thing that i want to mention um is what has recently emerged with the um, uh, with the coming of the new it rules yes. and kind of uh, new ways in which uh, online content is going to be regulated so there yeah. was this dream around internet being the utopic uh, medium but that's clearly not i mean again see this is how the cultural and the technical yeah. interface right yeah, you, yeah. you have to take the cultural very strongly so with that there has been a lot of pre censorship that is going on with these scripts because scripts are ready yeah for production but now they're going over those scripts so the scripts are have become the site of pre censorship which is actually quite sad so it is exciting in some ways yeah. but it is also quite sad in yeah. yeah in other ways yeah i mean in fact i just did a piece for a uh, critical collective on this you know this uh, this kind of uh, when i am sort of uh, challenging this idea of you know the lack of statutory regulations being necessarily regulatory because what it was also happening is it's actually making uh, content creators uh, more vulnerable the law is invoked in the most malicious malified ways and uh, it's actually there's a sort there's a regime of policial censorship the actual laws don't exist to prosecute anyone but let's say you invoke the uh, you know hurt sentiment or offense taking laws and then the police just arrives and arrests people you know the fir and the uh, the petition become like these regulatory mechanisms and actually ali abbas zafar who made tandav was the creator of tandav has also written something i mean in agreement with what you just said that this is actually a good thing that i mean now there are rules there won't be censor i mean trolling in the name of censorship yeah yeah that's uh, that's true uh, policing in the name of censorship really well thank you so much i mean this has been really enlightening uh, i hope you guys go and read rakesh's essay it's very lucidly written and it doesn't require any sort of uh, great training in cinema studies to appreciate and understand it so please do read his essay the link to it will be in the show notes thanks rakesh it was great talking to you thank you so much again kamaini for uh, having me here and i hope the listeners will take uh, something away uh, from this conversation i mean we've already talked about this that academic publishing is often i mean it all, also takes time uh for knowledge to really come out and we often tend to be very self contained in academic structures we tend to think that knowledge is supposed to be only academic but, but there's always a lot of relevance yeah. outside these spaces so I, so i'm glad that you've started this in the first place and uh, thank you so much for starting this in the first place actually so um <laughs> and uh, it was lovely <laughs> thank you this is a plug this will be used in ads <laughs> <laughs> happy to happy to endorse thank you so much <laughs>